as they are starting their equipment, if you'll turn to Revelation chapter 7. Um, I want to get into this section now where uh, we begin to talk about uh, this, we begin to see scriptures that line up with this reality. Uh, and even though the lamb was slain, if you'll notice on the board, Revelation 22, ignorance zero. <clears throat> so we won. <laughs> Um, that uh, there is that victory that comes not, not through just being slaughtered or death as you would understand it, but a victory through selfless giving for others. That has to be the, the motivation, you understand? It's not just, well, just let somebody kill you or something, you know. We're, and, and, of course, this goes far beyond just physical death we're talking about, but uh, certainly... For the lamb, it, it was that and more. <clears throat> but uh, I want to just go through some scriptures here. It, it'll take a little bit of time, but go through some of these scriptures and begin to point out some of these examples. So in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, And after uh, these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the winds... I uh, should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor in, on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east and having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants, uh, the servants of our God in their foreheads. <clears throat> I, I've got, I, there's things in... I could get into with that right now, but I don't want to do that. I want to just begin to uh, show you that so many times when uh, negative circumstances arise, some of it uh, by the Lord allowing, in this case, angels to do certain things, others, the beast, or beasts, because there are a lot of beasts in the book of Revelation, they uh, have a frontal attack and attack the saints. Whatever it is, the negative circumstances that roll in and the opportunity to be moved by your soul instead of by your spirit, the opportunity to be moved by negative circumstances and to react instead of uh, moving with the Lord in it. And so if you just drop down to uh, verse 9, all of a sudden, there's the, again, there's a turnaround. After this... Because uh, he just names off a bunch of the tribes from what we just read. But after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. And, um, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So there is this change in the atmosphere in verse 1 and 2 where there are, there are the winds of the earth, the four winds of the earth, and there, there's a, this negative wind and this negative thing that begins to blow in. And, um, uh, and like the seven churches, there's the opportunity to just flat be depressed. Well, where's God in all of this stuff? But all of a sudden, um, with, with that change, the people of God are seen as being around the throne and before the Lamb. And, and they're saying, salvation to our God who sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And their, their heart and their, their spirit and their victory is all pointed towards the Lamb. It's not, it's not you know, poor us, God deliver us from this, but in the midst of that, um, uh, and, and what we're going to see is a continuous pattern of this where there is a problem and then the lamb is honored. Okay, that's the, you know, that's the pattern. There's a problem, but, the, but when it turns to the saints, 
They're honoring the Lamb. Okay? So now let's go to Revelation 11. Book of Revelation, chapter 11. <clears throat> and let's look at verse 7 through 10. And when, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. That's one of the verses that we were referring to earlier. And now it's talking about the two witnesses. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the peoples... and. Uh, and they of the peoples and the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not permit their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they shall dwell upon the earth and shall rejoice over them, over their death, and shall make merry and shall send gifts. Sounds like Christmas just because they're dead, because the Christians are dead. Um, one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Okay, so that's, here is the... Uh, the, the demise, you know, we talked about that in a couple of classes back with Stephen, how he was bright and he was young and he was spirit-filled and anointed and powerful preacher and all this stuff. And, and he was just, he just died out so quickly and you just go, why? What, what a waste. See, what a waste. We don't understand what true waste is. A waste is somebody that preserves their life and protects their flesh and does all this. That's a waste. It's no waste for, for Stephen to lay down his life and what is he looking at? He's looking at Jesus on the throne just like all these guys were. He's looking at the lamb on the throne. And um, so here they are, you know, um, uh, you know, it says this beast comes out of the bottomless pit I mean, that's pretty ominous. And that he makes war against. I like that word against because it really shows the motivation. And, um, and shall overcome them and kill them. And so then these witnesses are slain and their dead bodies are desecrated, basically. They're left in the streets and then people are rejoicing and all this stuff's going on. And... Um, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God. That's what it says right here. I'm reading verse 11. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? And after that, af and after three days, after that, after three days, just like Jesus, after three days, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And, there, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon all them who saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up here. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And uh, let's see. I'll make sure how far I'm going to go here. Actually, let's drop down to verse 15. In the seven, uh, well, before we do that, let me just comment that these are some of those who love not their life unto the death. They overcame the enemy by that means. And the end result of, of it is the spirit of life. Now, how many of you have ever prayed or know people that have prayed that God give me the spirit of life? I mean, how many of you know that the church could use a hefty dose of the spirit of life, you know? the church world as well as our church or whatever to, you know. But folks, that's not going to come automatically or just by prayer or just by fasting or by wanting or desiring, sitting around desiring. But it comes through a particular way. And it says, and they were crucified in the same place Jesus, or they were killed and put to death in the same place that Jesus was crucified. Well, to God, it's all the place, anywhere that that which is lamb in his people, it's the same place that his son is crucified because that's what's going on. It is the death of his son, but it is his life in us. 
And you say, well, where do you get that in the scripture? Well, all over, frankly, but you know, you can go to 2 Corinthians uh, 4 where, where Paul says, death worketh in us, but life in you, that we bear about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. We, we, in our bodies, what, our dying? No, the dying, it's the lamb giving himself for others again and again, but now through his body. Amen? It, it, you know, he didn't say we bear about in our minds, listen carefully, we bear about in our minds the knowledge of the death of Christ. He didn't say that. He said we bear about in our bodies. In our mortal flesh is the wording there. So that, folks, this is more than just knowing deep stuff about the cross. This is actually Christ dying through us. That's what it says. Okay? Why? Because it's his life. Why would he die through us? Because he's self-giving. He was, he is, and he is to come. That's, that's how he's going to appear. <clears throat> All right. So let's go to, uh, there's more I could cover in that, but we've got several scriptures here I want to cover. Um, Revelation 13 and verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindred and tongues. All right, we'll just stop there. Power is given over all, over all. Okay, and then... And then immediately following, because there's more to it, uh, if you continue to read on, you can read all the way down to where I'm going to start. It's the beast um, and the mark of the beast and the 666. That's what follows what I just read, okay? He's, he's given power to overcome the saints. And there's all of this victory and all of that stuff up until... Chapter 14, verse 1, after it gets through talking about his great stuff. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. And in my margin, in my margin now, uh, this is a different Bible than maybe some of you are using, but in my margin it says literally, when it says having his father's name. It says literally his name and the name of his father. Okay. Written in their forehead. Okay. Well, if it's got his name, what name is that? Lamb. Okay. Not 666. Lamb. They're so identified, they're one with him. Of course, they're standing there with him. They're, they're with him. They're gathered to him. Um, let me make sure that I don't just read a whole... Oh. Well, this is... The truth is, this little testimony of the beast uh, doing all this stuff in chapter 13, which chapter 13 is one of the main chapters where the beast just rips and tears, okay? This is, this is the bad stuff. Immediately following that is the Lamb and those that are gathered to Him. There's the victory of the Lamb, and that goes all the way through 14. Let's see. And we got more verses than He did. The Lamb got more verses than the beast. Woohoo! We showed Him, didn't we? <laughs> the point being that right in the midst of showing the worst chapter, probably, in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, as soon as it's done, it's all about the Lamb. It's all about those who gather to Him. It's all about those who follow the Lamb, whithersoever He goeth. And there's more to be said on all that, and I don't want to, I, I want to just sort of, I've got a lot of scriptures here, so I'm not going to, take the time to go all through that. Okay, chapter, let's go, let's go to chapter 13 again, but I want us to look this time at verse 15. And he hath power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would worship the image of the beast 
as many, and would cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Should be killed. Okay, you see it? Everybody see that? Okay. Now Revelation 15. And this whole chapter here is, again, glory to the Lamb. So chapter 14 was and chapter 15 was. But let's see. Um, verse 2, let's do that. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and they sang the song of the Lamb. This is those who got the victory over the beast. Let me just make sure here. Um, Let's see. Okay. It, it was verse 15 that we read in chapter 13. Okay. And he, uh, as many as would not worship the image of the beast, he killed. As many as would not worship the image of the beast, he killed. Okay. These right here who got the victory over the image of the beast by being killed. Because <laughs> it doesn't mention, it doesn't, it doesn't mention those who got the mark of the beast and those who didn't and got killed and then another group. Those who overcame, overcame by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and that's also in chapter 13, because they love not their life unto the death. All right, but the whole of chapter 15 explains that victory that took place. All right, let's go to Revelation 17. Revelation 17, and, and see, I've got, like, I've got marked down all the way through verse 13, which is way too much reading here, but I'm trying to uh, make a point. And it's talking about the seven bowls, and they're talking about mystery Babylon, the great whore Babylon, the great on the back of a, a beast. And um, this beast is, let's see, how about verse 6, Revelation 17, 6. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great wonder. All right. So here, um, here is slaughter again. All right, now read verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. All right, so they're making war against the Lamb. They've killed the Bab mystery Babylon, the great harlot has killed the saints and is drunk on the blood of the saints and of the martyr, martyrs. But it turns around and it sounds like there is victory and there is victory. It's the victory of the lamb. But this in verse 14 is, and they shall make war with the lamb, folks. This is talking about Christ crucified. This is, there is no time when they make war with him that they don't kill him. It's when he makes war with them that he kills them. You following? He was he won, but he won through death. Amen. They made war against him, and when they did, even though you know, I mean, it says, and they should, and uh, and shall overcome them. But he, but what, see, we haven't had time to get into that, but we'll get into it. He that overcometh. Remember hearing that over and over to every one of the seven churches. You got this wrong. You did this wrong. There's this in your camp. There's all of this stuff, but he that overcometh, folks, we'll see it. We'll go through it. Overcoming only happens through death. They overcame him 
by the slaughter of the lamb. They overcame him because they loved not their life unto the death. Okay? At least that much I can give you. So when it says that he overcame here, he is king of kings and lord of lords. He, he, he had it written on this cross. You know. Some people say he was actually the cross that he died on was two pieces of wood that went like this, you know, like a big X. But how can you hang a sign above his head that says king of kings and lord of lords? You know what I mean? Anyway, you know, I just think through this thing. I'm going, okay, well, the Bible says, so I don't get that. But um, <laughs> but he's, folks, he's king of kings right there. He's already king of kings. He's already won the victory by going to that cross and laying down his life. Again, we're just hitting, we're hitting these surface ones just so you can begin to see sort of a pattern. Okay, Revelation 18, 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Okay, next verse. And after these things, I heard a great voice of many people. Does anybody see how many times immediately following the slaughter, the death, the overcoming, the killing, immediately there's this great multitude rejoicing? And we've read at least three of them, maybe four. It's almost like there's something to that. And that was what caught my eye was I went, you know what? This is, this is a pattern. I'm seeing a pattern here. That every time it mentions something like verse 24 of chapter 18, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Just a slaughter, a slaying of what's of God. All of a sudden there's this big gathering with a great voice singing hallelujah, salvation. Just like in chapter 5. It's like they came out of chapter 2 and 3 dirty and beat up and defiled and all of a sudden when they see the lamb they see the victory of life out of death and they see the way that they can go that will bring forth the lord then they jump right in there and start shouting with him and they do it all the way through the book of revelation it's a pattern all right now let's see i have a little a few scriptures here that i separated and i'm so i'm going to go ahead and we're going to look at these but i i can't remember what they were for, so let's do it. Let's, uh, Revelation 12, verse 7. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. And, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in the earth. And the great dragon was cast out, and that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who, per, who deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, several things you get here. One is the dragon, the dragon called the devil and Satan, who deceiveth the whole world, the, that old serpent. So you got the dragon, the old serpent, devil, and Satan. So if anybody tells you those are different people or different things, this right here gives them all to this one beast, as it were. Okay? And then... Uh, the next verse as a comparison, next two verses as a comparison. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come, okay, now is come salvation and strength at the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast out who accused them before God day and night and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. All right, so there's war in heaven. It looks like Michael the archangel beats him, beats him, and yet this says that they overcame by the blood of the lamb, by the defeat, not by the victory of the archangel Michael. I mean, you have to look at, you, you know, it's like we read right over some of this stuff, but you have to realize, no, they overcame by his defeat and their victory. And they overcame by loving not their life even unto the death. Okay? Uh, let's see. Revelation 17, 
Let's go back there, and we've only got a few more scriptures left on this. Revelation 17, verse 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Let's see. That's, that's it right there. This is the ten horns coming together and being drawn together and God puts it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Okay? Um, God is bringing all this stuff together to reveal the Lamb. All this bad that's being released has a purpose. And it does reveal the Lamb time and time again, chapter after chapter. When all of this bad brushes in, Jesus doesn't go, hold, hold it, no, stop. We're the ones that are victorious. He wants the Lamb revealed. And he's allowing this stuff. In fact, he's, he's again, he's, and God puts it in their heart. And they're fulfilling his will. Well, you know, it's, it's the old Judas thing. Well, you know, he was one of the 12, and yet he turned on the Lord, and yet Jesus clearly says he, he knew, but it's not, you know, have I not called you, and is not one of you a devil? That's what he said. That's his wording. He knows what's going on. Jesus knows what's going on. He's not freaked. Jesus is not freaked out. Because he knows that this guy is going to help him manifest the true nature and spirit of God. And he's going to help him win the victory over death, hell, and the grave by allowing him and empowering him with the scribes and the Pharisees to put Jesus to death. I don't hear a lot of amens now. <laughs> well, what does that mean for us? Man, somebody gets off, somebody starts after us, somebody's got, got it out for us, and we go, oh, stop them, Lord, you know, kill them, you know, before they kill me or something, instead of, instead of, this is the hand of the Lord. I think Jeremiah clearly said that, you know, uh, <clears throat> talked about Nebuchadnezzar being God's sword. That's what he called him. And my servant. The Lord called him my servant. We go, you know, and of course that's the way Israel rebelled. I mean, they're going, he's not, no, he's not, Jeremiah, no, that's wrong. You're not saying the word of God. We don't dig your gospel, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, you know, I don't dig that gospel, man. What I want is a gospel where we win. Well, they didn't win. They all went into captivity except the poor and the outcast were left in the land because they didn't want them. Well, that's who was drawn to Jesus, the blind and the lame and the halt and the outcast. <laughs> you know, so we're always resisting. Uh, I mean, the wording of this is pretty powerful. And God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. What? To reveal his son, to reveal the lamb, to... And to break the power of this enemy. <clears throat> you say, well, you're not, you know, you're strong enough. Break it through that power. The cross is the power of God. The weakness of God, as I've seen at the cross, is more powerful than men. And the cross is foolishness to people who don't understand it. It is, but it is the power of God, and it is the wisdom of God. And we can hear that, and we can, we can even acknowledge it, but I'm telling you, there's a difference. I'm going to put it like this. There's a difference when you start walking through the book of Revelation and start having something revealed, actually, in the book of Revelation. It's shocking to have something actually revealed in the book of Revelation. <laughs> you know? And you start walking through, and what's being revealed is over and over, every time things go bad, they, they're not freaking out. They're with the Lamb. They're, 
acknowledging and glorifying the Lamb over and over and over. And they are not going to the throne room to get the Lamb to reverse the thing. They're in the midst of the thing that's going to reverse his power and his force and his strength by laying down their lives. You know, I've, I've probably got it in some notes here, if not here somewhere, but I've often thought, it's probably here somewhere. But, you know, uh, Rome, out of all the nations and all of the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the Huns and all of the different people groups that they went against, they decided to per persecute the Christians. <laughs> I mean, that's just stupid. That's like picking on a mouse or something. You know what I mean? It's like, well, yeah, we'll send the forces of Rome against that mouse. You know, all, all 100,000 of you, get him. And yet, <clears throat> stories of, you know, one of the stories I remember hearing was a guy that was in the Colosseum. And, and uh you know, they'd put them in there and they'd let the lions loose to rip them or they'd let the gladiators kill them and stuff like that. And uh, they'd all sit in the, in the Coliseum, yeah, and, and this stuff. And, and uh, there was this uh, gladiator who, you know, had really seen Jesus in some of these Christians. And uh, he, he came out and he was supposed to, taunt him and then kill him and he had a big spear and stuff like that and he's full of armor and the Christians are standing there in regular little robe and whatever and and uh, and he looks into the Christian's eyes and he said and he's got this spear pointed right ahead of him and he says I, I can't do it he says there's something about you there's something different I can't just kill you and he said you know he didn't go into all that but you know he's a warrior and he's used to fighting beast and he's used to fighting you know and winning over the strongest of men i mean that's why he's still around because he's defeated great and he's looking at this guy and he goes this ain't right you know what i mean this is slaughtering something that's totally innocent hmm wonder what that's about and so he 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 kneels down in front of the guy He's, you know, he's on one knee and he's holding the spear at him and he said, I can't do it. And the Christian says, it's okay. I'm fine. Do it. He says, you know, I'm going to be with the Lord. He said, but I'll pray for you and I'll pray for your soul and whatever. And he says, but you need to do it because if you don't, they're going to kill you. This whole Colosseum's looking at you. They're going to kill you. And he said, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And so the Christian thrust himself on the, soul, on the spear. You know, just like Jesus giving his life for us. And, of course, that guy's just like, oh, my God. You know, <laughs> he did that so I wouldn't die. Jesus, Christ and him crucified, reenacted over and over in all of his body. It's proof that he's living in us. All right. Anyway. Um, all right. So let me just read a little bit here. I feel good that we're making some progress here. All right. When all around these saints are beasts and blasphemies and atrocities, they are rejoicing and they worship because worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power. There in the slain one, they see the fountain of true power, one who was slain by these very forces. When they look at the cross, they not only see the victory, but the way of victory. And it gives them strength. I'm thinking, you know, I wept over this chapter two and three, this, so it always almost brings me to tears to see them come out of that hopeless, helpless darkness that they were in. Um, and it gives them strength and faith to live Christ crucified in the midst of oppression. The outward, appearances, uh, the outward appearance tries to convince otherwise, but they have eyes of the lamb. They are his body. They are the body of the lamb. So they have his eyes. 
<clears throat> Throughout the book of Revelation, we find many who are in weakness and powerlessness, yet they rest upon Christ crucified in his power. Therefore, though powerless uh, is constantly contrasted with mightiness in this book, yet they are not without power, for they know that with the power of mightiness comes the power to conquer, but with the power of Christ crucified, one becomes God's definition of more than a conqueror. And that is what that definition is. You check it out, Romans 8. <clears throat> All right. I need to... Oh, my. <laughs> I need to try to get more done here, and so we've got a few more minutes left. I want to talk about this lamb opening the seals, opening the book, open the scroll. We read some of it in the other, other class. Let's just, let me just go quickly there and read again the part that we read last class. It's Revelation 5. Um, um, <clears throat> verse 2, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the, scroll, the book and to loose its seals? And no man in heaven, not get that, and no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look on it. And I wept much, and because no man was found worthy to open and to read the scroll, neither to look on it. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose its seven seals. And I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slaughtered having seven horns and seven eyes <clears throat> and he came and took the the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne and and when he had taken the, the book, the four living creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open its seals, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and have made us unto our God a kingdom of priests and we shall reign on the earth. And so there's this big exaltation then, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that, that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature that is heaven and on the earth and in the sea and all of them heard, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell and worshiped him that liveth forever. All right, what a glorious picture, do we, but do we have any idea what's about to happen? I mean, do we, or what that's even about? I mean, this is, this is crazy. So then, uh, verse 6, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four living creatures said, Come. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. And, I, and when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And, uh, and there was given unto him a great sword, and... And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I beheld in low a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, A measure of wheat for a Daenerys, and three measures of barley for a Daenerys, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say come and I looked and behold a pale horse and his and his name that sat upon it was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and death and with the beasts of the earth <clears throat> all right I'm gonna just stop right there all right now let's 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 kind of try to meet these pictures together <laughs> you got 
you got everybody is freaked out in heaven because there's this book and nobody can open the seals. Oh, we want those seals open. Or do you? What's it, what is all this? You know, I looked and behold, a pale horse and his name that rode upon it was death and hell followed after. You know, and so we're all weeping. Oh, who's, who can open the book? You know, this is terrible. You know, we're going, oh, it's the, you know, it's the word of God. I've said that many a time, but it's not. It is the release of this horrible junk, the first release, the man, this, that just starts coming forth. And so as soon as he takes the book and they go, oh, you know, you, they know what's in it because the four living creatures are going, come. One horse, one of the seven, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse comes. And another, they know what's in it. But they're all going, none of us, not in, not in earth or under the earth or in heaven can open this. Thou art worthy. Why? Because thou wast slain and by thy blood. <clears throat> the things that these seven churches have witnessed in chapter 5 are preparatory to the rest of the book. God wastes no time in tra transitioning them from glorying in the Lamb on the throne to living according to the Lamb in the worst situations. First they are presented with the Lamb on the throne in Revelation 5, but, but then they are immediately confronted with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, bringing plagues, disease, famine, persecution, destruction. Surely there must be some shock, some sort of shock when those gathered saw that the opening of the seals of the book actually begins the process of unleashing a long list of terrible events. Is this the order? And are we following the order of the book? In Revelation 5, 5, they stand there and are witness to the Lamb opening the seals of horror that will soon rain much hardship upon the saints of God. Right? It's the beginning of all this nightmare that will come upon the saints. Is it possible that one of the heavenly worshipers might have thought, what is he doing? Talking about Jesus. What are you, what are you doing? Don't, don't unleash that. Don't, don't, you know, thou art worthy, but don't do it. You know what I'm saying? Something like that. I mean, you say, well, where do you come up with this? If I was there, that's what I would have said. Don't do it. You know, it's like opening Pandora's box. And yet, the worship and the, oh, you can open the book. Oh, and weeping, we can't, we can't do it. Only you can. What is going on? What sort of madness is this? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so they say, what are you doing? What, what is he doing? Is he our enemy or our friend? The answer is, he is about to end all oppression. <laughs> That's the answer. You know, what is he doing? Is he our, why are you doing it? He's about to end all oppression. They should not be afraid of for him to go ahead and open up the worst because the lamb has already won and on the basis of that we will go through it by the same lamb within us. One of the main questions voiced by those present was who is worthy to open the seals? <clears throat> Clearly they were concerned that the right person do so. For to just have anyone do it could result in enormous tragedy. Think about it. Why, gee, why this one? Why this lamb? And I'm telling you, if not the lamb, this is going to be a nightmare. This is, this is horrible. <clears throat> Very quickly it becomes plain to all that only a crucified Messiah, only the lamb can endure what is coming. Only the lamb will unleash it because only the lamb has the right perspective as to how to handle and defeat the beasts that are coming. He's about to end all oppression. The question that, arise, uh, that arises of who is worthy to open the seals comes from a knowledge that you must not open the scrolls 
unless you have the key. The weeping ended when the lamb took the book because the lamb is the key. He's the key to the rest of the book. He's the key to what's coming. If you open the scrolls without him, you will not survive. Can I get amen somewhere? Also, you will be confused by the horror and lack of outward victory. The lamb becomes the key to traversing through the things that the book of Revelation is about to set forth. Understanding lamb is most important. The plan that the scrolls unfold to us is that of evil overcoming the weak, but that the, that the defeat is also the unfolding plan and that defeat is the means of victory. It all rests on death, but lamb death. He has conquered through death, Revelation 5, 5. By his sacrifice, he's freed us from our sins, ransomed us from the beast, and established a new kingdom. That We just went through the book of Revelation with that sentence. We find later in Revelation 10, 9, that when the scroll is presented to John, he is not told to open it, but to eat it. Here, he is in the process of eating, not the word of God, as might be assumed, but eating the sufferings that it releases to become a follower of the Lamb. And then finally, just a quick summary now, and then we'll be done. <clears throat> the book of Revelation presents us with a progression. First, Jesus' church is seen in the form of seven churches. As such, they are weak and oppressed. But then they're brought to a revelation of the Lamb in chapter 5 where they find him as the supreme object of worship. But then they are seen not just as worshipers of the Lamb, but followers of him in chapter 14. In chapter 5, they worship him in his own right, but then they follow him into his way. They, they, they worship him in his own right because he, he died. But in chapter 14, they're following him into his way. Uh, they have bowed the knee and worshipped. They have bowed the knee and worshipped to that lamb spirit even before the seals were open. Remember, they all were worshipping the lamb before the seals were open. Now we're going to find out if they're really with him. So it's probably good they were in that spirit when they got, you know what I'm saying, it's the best place to be when that, those seals come fly those four horsemen of the apocalypse fly off the page into your face. <laughs> um, they have bowed the knee and worshiped that lamb spirit even before the seals were opened, but in chapter 14, they are seen following him after the seals have been loosed. Isn't that great? In chapter 14, the seals have been loosed and they're still with him. Glorious victory. In Revelation, both in the book and in receiving God's revelation concerning these things, they lived their lives in faithful witness to the Lamb. This was their calling and this is their victory. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your son and we thank you for the word the book of Revelation that is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is revealing the true spirit and nature and the way of victory by his life. And only the lamb in us will be able to go through those seals. But Father, we trust your hand with the seven churches and you trust your hand with us. We thank you that Jesus did go ahead and open the seals, or that the Lamb did go ahead and open the seals. We thank you because in so doing, you will bring us into conformity with your nature. We shall stand with you on Mount Zion. And you will get all the glory and we'll sing your song. So we love you, Lord. We love you, Father. We love you, Holy Spirit. We bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're dismissed.